Psalm 100. If you would take your Bibles and turn to the passage that we had read just a moment ago, Psalm 100, the Thanksgiving Psalm. Let's bow together in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we pray that you will continue to lead us as we worship you. We pray, Father, that we may be attentive to what the Spirit of God is going to say to us through your word. And help us to be more than just hearers, Lord. Help us to be obedient to these truths. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Psalm 100 is in the last of eight psalms, obviously beginning in Psalm 93, that encourage and remind both Israel as well as ourselves to worship God as creator, as king, as judge, as warrior, as the revealer of truth, as well as the good shepherd. These psalms are called the enthronement psalms, and in them we bow down and we reverence the king, seated on his throne in his sovereign reign, in his dominion and majesty. He is the sovereign of the created universe, as far as the Hubble telescope can see, and even beyond that. He's the absolute sovereign of our planet, of human history, and of our own personal history as well. All of these psalms put us flat on our faces before a sovereign God. Psalm 100 is the only psalm that actually tells us its purpose or why it was written. In the superscription in your Bibles, before verse 1, it says that this is a psalm for giving thanks. That's its purpose. The purpose of this psalm is so that we will give thanks. It not only tells us how to give thanks, but at the very end it tells us why we should be giving thanks. And gratitude is, or at least should be, one of the hallmarks of the Christian faith. We are told to praise or to thank God multiple times in the Old Testament as well as in the New Testament. For example, in Ephesians chapter 5, 19 and 20, it says, Speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 15, it says, Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that confess his name. Psalm 100, of course, falls in that thanksgiving genre. Sometimes, even those of us who know Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, we know that our sins are forgiven. We have the hope of eternal life with God. Even we who are part of the family of God can grow discouraged and if we're not careful, become very critical in our hearts. And it's when we pause and reflect on what we have that we are reminded of all that God has really done for us. An example of what I'm talking about could be found in the Old Testament in Psalm 73. A man by the name of Asaph records his own struggle as he looks at the disparity, or at least the apparent disparity, between those who actually honor God and those who, don't have, who, don't, who do not want to have anything to do with God. It really grieves him. In fact, he writes at the very beginning of the psalm, Truly God is good to Israel, to those whose hearts are pure, but as for me, <clears throat> excuse me just for a second. That's a great time to need a drink of water, isn't it? <clears throat> Let me start again. Truly God is good to Israel, to those whose hearts are pure. But as for me, I came so close to the edge of the cliff. My feet were slipping and I was almost gone. For I envied the proud when I saw them prosper despite their wickedness. He goes on to describe them as those whose bodies are healthy and strong. They aren't troubled like other people or plagued with problems like everyone else. Here he is complaining that serving God gave him no reprieve from some of the natural problems that occur in life. In fact, what he's saying here is it looks to him like those who reject God, those who actually mock God, come out ahead in life. But then later on the psalm, he makes this statement. Then one day, I went into your sanctuary, O God, and I thought about the destiny of the wicked. 
Isn't it interesting? His criticism of God actually turns to praise when he realized that the prosperity of the wicked was so limited. All that they could enjoy, all that they would enjoy, was, was based upon what they would experience in this life on this earth. Whereas those who were followers of God, those who truly had accepted Christ as their Savior, actually had all of eternity to enjoy the blessings of God. It's interesting. Perspective is a wonderful thing. And that's what celebrating Thanksgiving does for us every year. Now, hopefully, we don't wait for a date on the calendar or one weekend during the year in order to express gratitude to God. But definitely during this weekend, we will pause and reflect upon all that God has done for us. Be reminded of his blessings. To be reminded of who God is and what he's accomplished for us. And that's what Psalm 100 actually does for us. In this particular psalm, we are going to discover that there are a series of commands. The commands basically are related to how we are to worship, how we are to praise God, how we are to give thanks to God. And then at the very end of the psalm, in verse 5, we're going to discover three reasons why we should give those praises and worship to God. And, And this is a psalm that really drives us to God because in every one of these situations, the object is God himself. God is the hero of Psalm 100. So you'll notice the very first thing the psalmist says in verse 1. Shout for joy to the Lord. Now some of your translations will probably say, make a joyful noise to the Lord. In the original Hebrew language, those two expressions, however you want to translate it, basically it's just one word. And the one word is this. Shout. That's really what it's saying. What what verse 1 is saying here is, just shout. Now, in case you don't realize, this is a very loud passage of Scripture. One person said, this hymn commands us to worship God, the Good Shepherd, with physical energy, with focused intensity, intensity, wholeheartedly and at full throttle. Now, when you were getting ready to come to this service this morning, I dare say that is not what you had in mind when you thought of coming into the presence of God and worshiping Him. See, we are more comfortable, generally speaking as a church, with a verse like Psalm 46, verse 10. Be still and know that I am God. That's kind of the Baptist anthem, isn't it? That's kind of how how we view worship is supposed to be. Or in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, you know that section, the first 11 verses, it says uh, there's a time for everything, a season for every activity under heaven. And then later on it says there's a time to be silent. We think, yeah, that's a Baptist service right there. It's a time for us just to to not say anything. Well, interesting here, and there is a time to be silent. There's a time to be reflective. There's a time to to, to meditate. But what Psalm 100 is saying is this isn't the time. This isn't the weekend. We need to shout. We need to let our voices be heard. We need to express to God how much we appreciate everything he's given to us. Everything that he has done for us. I have worshipped in a church that shouted. I don't know if you've ever had that experience. But I've actually been in a church where all they did, not all they did, but there came a point in their service when they shouted. It was over in Uganda. Janet and I were there. And uh, we actually came to a part in the service, and we didn't understand what was going on because we didn't speak the language. But they actually shouted. They, looked, they pointed to the four different directions uh, of the compass, and they just shouted. They just shouted. I remember one time hearing E.V. Hill. Do you know who E.V. Hill is? The the late E.V. Hill, I should say, preacher down in Los Angeles. He talked about, I remember him preaching. He said, now, if I got to this part in my sermon, I would just say to the congregation, shout. And they would shout. And that's how they they did that. I always always thought I'd like to experience that in E.V. Hill's church. Now, let me just say this. I'm not suggesting that we need to add another item to our order of worship service, Okay. I'm not saying, well, let's sing two songs, we'll take the offering and prayer, and then let's have the congregation yell. In fact, Pastor Matt, why don't you come up here and just, we'll just yell together. So that, that's not what I'm saying, okay? That's not a bad thing, but that, that's, I don't think that's really the intent here. What the psalmist is talking about here is we don't worship just with our head. It's more than just head knowledge, as important as that is. 
But what he's getting at here is it also should include our heart. We should be roused. We should be emotionally connected to worshiping God. You know, there are some people who come to worship in the spirit of Eeyore. You know the story of Winnie the Pooh, Eeyore the donkey? There are some people who come to church with that kind of a mindset. They're, they're almost depressed to be here. They're not too sure why they woke up that morning. The, the psalmist says, no, that's not what this psalm's about. That's not what Thanksgiving is about. This is a time to shout. This is a time to express joy. Make a joyful noise. Just shout. And that's the first command. Maybe that's something you need to do this weekend. Yeah, I, I'm not saying... It, this morning you necessarily need to do that, but, but go off in the bush somewhere by yourself and just, just express to God what's ever on your heart. Let him know how much you love him, how much you appreciate him, how thankful you are for everything that he's done for you. So the very first command that the psalmist gives us is simply to shout. Shout out to God. But notice the second thing he says is worship. Now this whole thing has to do with worship, but he specifically comes in here and he says, worship the Lord with gladness. Now again, some of your translations will probably have the word serve instead of worship. And I'm telling you, there's not a big difference between the two. If you really worship God, you will serve him. And when you are serving God, you are actually worshiping God. In fact, we're actually going to talk about this next week. We're going to start a, a series, a four-part series on stewardship. I probably should have told you that, but I, that's what we're going to start on next week. And we're going to be looking at Romans chapter 12. And we're at least going to touch upon this very thing here. We're here to worship. And worship, as most of you know, as most of you know, is simply recognizing and acknowledging the worth of God. What we have come here today is collectively as the body of Christ to say God is worthy. God is worthy. 2 Samuel 22, 4, I call to the Lord who is worthy of praise. 1 Chronicles, for great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. Revelation 4, you are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things and by your will they were created and have their, and have their being. Our God is worthy. That's what worship is all about. We are acknowledging the worthiness of God. But you notice he says, worship with gladness. With gladness. Again, you'll notice the theme of joy is spread throughout this entire psalm. But when we come into the presence of God, we should be glad that we are there. One person said, this is not lip service. Anybody can act spiritual for 90 minutes on a Sunday morning. I wonder what would happen if I preached for 90 minutes on a Sunday morning. You'd see the nursery workers with placards coming into protest next week, I'm sure. He says, real worship is life service on a day-to-day -day basis. I'm at a stage in my life where I don't care where God puts me on the field. I just don't want him to sit me on the, be on the bench. It's a privilege to do whatever the Lord would have you to do. When the Lord asks you to serve him, the psalmist says, don't do it complaining, ritualistically, grudgingly, or mechanically. You are to serve the Lord with gladness. That's the second command. Worship. Worship the Lord with gladness. And notice the third command that he gives us. We're to come into his presence. Now, we receive many invitations in life. You've received invitations to parties. You've received invitations to weddings. You have received invitations to graduations. I mean, we receive invitations for all kinds of things. And whenever you receive an invitation, you should be thinking, and I'm sure you do, this is an honor. It's an honor to be remembered. It's an honor to, that someone would want me there to celebrate this particular event in their life. In fact, the more limited the number of invitations, and the more important that event or person is, at least in your mind, the more significant is that invitation to you. And here we have God saying, come before me. You have been invited to stand in the presence of Almighty God. You're not just part of the crowd, one amongst millions. You don't have to sit in the back 
as if I just got in by the, the skin of my teeth. You don't have to have your nose pressed up against the windows wondering how the good people are doing. No, God says, you come. You come into my presence. This morning, you and God are having a meeting one-on-one. -on -one. Now, yeah, we're all here together. That is true. But this morning, you worship God one-on-one. -on -one. It's, just, it's just you and him that are communicating this morning. And so this weekend, when we say thanks to God, we say it personally. We've been invited. We don't send a representative. We come into the presence of God simply to say thank, thank you. And notice again, when you come into the presence of God, you're supposed to bring something. Did you see that? You see what you're supposed to bring? Joyful songs. Again, the theme of joy is coming up again. We are to bring joyful songs. You don't come with criticisms. You don't come with complaints. You, you don't come with questions. There's an appropriate time for that, but not in a psalm of thanksgiving. Not in a weekend like this. No, we come simply to express our gratitude to God for who He is and for everything that He has done. And now we come to the fourth command that's given to us. And that is simply to know. Know that the Lord is good. You know, this psalm tells us that He's our creator as well as our shepherd. It says, He who made us, we are His. We are His people, the sheep of His pasture. What that is saying to us is, is He's not only created us, but He cares for us. Like a shepherd cares for his sheep. Now, as our creator, we are accountable to him. That's what stewardship is all about. That's what we're going to discover over the next few weeks. We're accountable to our creator, but as our shepherd, we know that he leads us. He guides us. He provides for us. And knowing that we are part of his flock, that we are his sheep, makes all the difference in the world. There was a book, uh, it was, had to be published maybe 25, 30 years ago, maybe more. Many of you, or some of you at least are familiar with it, A Shepherd Looks at Psalm 23 by Philip Keller. In that particular book, he talks about his experience as a shepherd actually in East Africa. And he talks about the land adjacent to his was actually rented out to a tenant, tenant shepherd who didn't take very good care of his sheep. He talks about the land being overgrazed, eaten down to the ground, the sheep were thin, there were parasites on them. They were attacked by wild anim animals. And Keller's talked about especially remembering how the neighbor sheep would line up at the fence and blankly stare in the direction of his green grass and his healthy sheep, almost as if they yearned to be delivered from their abusive shepherd. They longed to come to the other side of the fence and belong to him. It makes a huge difference who your shepherd is. And we, as followers of Christ, identify Jesus as our shepherd. And that has made all the difference in the world. In fact, is that not what Psalm 23 says? The Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. I'm sure that's what Jesus had in mind in, in John chapter 10. Just let me read to you this passage. But obviously, this is the imagery that is coming forward. Jesus said, I tell you the truth. The man who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in by some other way, is a thief and a robber. The man who enters by the gate is the shepherd of his sheep. The watchman opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they'll never follow a stranger. In fact, they'll run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech, but they did not understand what he was telling them. Therefore, Jesus said again, I tell you the truth. I am the gate for the sheep. All who ever came before me were thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. He will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The Lord is my shepherd. 
See, it's one thing for us to stand up and say, the Lord is God. It's another thing to stand up and say, the Lord is my shepherd. To stand up and say, the Lord is God, you're, you're merely repeating a fact. You're, you're simply saying what is true. But when you stand up and say, the Lord is my shepherd, you're saying that you've made this personal. and That personally you're a follower of Jesus Christ. What you're really saying is you got to that point in your life by the grace of God where you've actually confessed your sin. You recognize that you've been separated from God, that sin has kept you away from God, and you've accepted His death, burial, and resurrection personally for yourself. And so not only today can you say, yes, God is God, but you can also say the Lord is my shepherd. And that makes all the difference in the world. One final command, and then we'll get to the reasons why we need to obey these commands. He says we need to enter. We need to enter. Enter his gates with thanksgiving as well as with praise. This kind of brings this section of the psalm to a conclusion. This this is what he's been talking about for verses 1 through 4. And basically what he's saying is worship is not a spectator sport. When you come to church, it's not simply to observe, but it's to engage. It's to get your mind as well as your heart in the place where you are worshiping God. If we're not careful, there are times when we can come to church and we almost like, we act like the judges at an Olympic event. We score every aspect of the the service. Well, the music wasn't too bad. I'm going to give that four out of five. Well, the sermon, it was a little weak today, so on and so forth. And sometimes we can respond that way if we are not careful. Instead, we are to enter his gates with thanksgiving. We are to come here to praise God. And here's here's the amazing thing. When we will come with that attitude, we will leave here having been blessed by God, having met God, and being encouraged in our hearts. But the question is why? Why should we obey these commands? Well, that's really what verse 5 is. There are three reasons here, and I'm going to go through these fairly quickly. Number one, he says, because the Lord is good. Very simple. The Lord is good. People's opinion of God has changed in our generation. Maybe it's true of other generations, but I've noticed in the last few years especially, people's opinion of God has changed. When they don't get what they want, even what they think they need, they begin to question the existence of God or the ability of God or or God's motive. They really wonder, is God good? Is God really good? But we fail to understand what it means when the Bible says that God is good. I love this quote by A.W. Tozer. He says, the goodness of God is that which disposes him to be kind, cordial, benevolent, and full of goodwill toward men. He's tender-hearted and of quick sympathy, and his unfailing attitude toward all moral beings is open, frank, and friendly. By his nature, he is inclined to bestow blessedness, and he takes holy pleasure in the happiness of his people. That's the God we serve. That's why we can say the Lord is good. That's why we need to obey him. That's why we offer him thanks today. We may not get what we want. We may not get even what we think we need. But we do know that because God is good, he will give us what he knows is what's best for us. And so we praise him. We worship him. We thank him because he's so good. And then secondly... It's because his love endures forever. His love is unending. 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. It's like John sits back and goes, can you, can you imagine this? Just think about this. A holy God, a sovereign God, an all-powerful God, And because of his love, he allows us to be part of his family. He's adopted us into his family. He claims us as his own. It's like John can't hardly believe this. 
See, if you have Christ this morning and nothing else, you have everything you need to be thankful for this Thanksgiving weekend. And if you have everything, but you don't have Christ, then you are still lacking. You are still not complete. 1 John 4, verse 10, this is love. Not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. I love the perspective that John gives for us here. He goes, this is love. Not that we love God. Well, that's obvious, isn't it? Of course we would love God. God's love is enduring. God's, God is good. I mean, who wouldn't love a God like that, a, a person like that? Obviously, that's not love. Here's love that He loved us. That's the amazing thing, that God loved us. Then the third reason that the psalmist gives us here, he says, his faithfulness continues through all generations. God is always faithful. God is always true to his word. 1 Corinthians 1.9, God who has called you into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, is faithful, period. God is faithful. You can always count on him. He will never, ever forsake you. Somebody summarized that verse, verse 5, in this way. They said, this is a succinct, a succinct statement of Jewish theology proper. A summary of what they believed about God's core nature is that God is good, God is love, and that God is faithful. If they were content to praise God for those three reasons, how much more you and I should praise God? For know that God's love, goodness, and faithfulness are not just theological, theological propositions. They are a living person. God's goodness has a name. God's love has a face. God's faithfulness became pierceable. He chose to die rather than give up on you. So we praise God for Jesus Christ, who lived the life we could never live, who died the death we should have died, so that by his blood and righteousness, we can be restored to a living God. That's why we pause today, this weekend, and give thanks. And let's not forget, in all of our celebrations, to thank the one who gave us so much, including his own son, so that we could have eternal fellowship with our God. We're going to take just a couple of minutes right now and go into the presence of God and thank Him. Thank Him for all the blessings that He's given to us. Thank Him for who He is, for what He accomplished for us. And if you can, you need to pause and thank Him for the salvation that He has granted to you.